Okay, so so we'll, we'll make a start. Um, is Angela Camille on? I haven't seen it here, but the carry on is not there. Okay, um, we'll, we'll make a start. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the fourth technical session. A technical session organized by Nigeria Society of Engineers, Protem Manchester Branch. The title of uh, this afternoon's uh, session is Digitizing a Smart Built Environment. The future is today. My name is uh, Engineer Patrick Obidoin. I'm the Protem Publicity Secretary of NSC, Protem Manchester Branch. The technical session will be delivered by distinguished professor of business automation and computational intelligence. Uh, professor David J. Edwards. Professor Edwards is the director of Center for Business Innovation and Enterprise at uh, Birmingham City University. Uh, more introduction will follow uh, by the technical secretary. A quick shout out to some of the distinguished personalities in our midst. Um, we've got our guest speaker, so he's here with us. Um, I'm also informed the president of NSC will be joining us. I'm not sure if he's on yet, but he'll be joining us. Uh, that's engineer Babagana Mohammed, FNSC. We'll, well, I'm also pleased to inform you that we'll be joined by engineer Aliu Rabiu, FNSC the current uh, president. We will also be having a uh, joining us this afternoon, engineer Dr. Alex Momo, FNSC, the NSC executive secretary. We also have um, our patron in our midst here, someone who's been helping this branch, nurturing this branch to grow. And that's uh, engineer Isaac Olorofemi, FNSC, uh, NSC past president. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much, Patrick. My pleasure. Thank Good you, evening, sir. everybody. So, um, engineer Dr. Books, the branch here is also with us here. Eng uh, Dr. Irene Okade, the general, as we refer to her. We also have engineer Camille Okedara, the technical secretary. Um, we should also be joined by Dr. Mohamed Ngala, a member of the steering committee and immediate past guest speaker um, on this on this forum. So with this, um, I'll give uh, the floor to Dr. Obux for the chairman's opening brief. Dr. Obux, over to you, sir. <coughs> Thank you um, very much, um, Patrick, for the very warm introduction of our special guest today. As always, it's always a pleasure uh, to warmly welcome members to this very interactive and also informative session. Our last three lectures have been very sound and the feedback that we received has been very, very good as well. And I can promise you that today lecture will not be any different. As the lecture will be going on, there will be opportunity for you to post your questions using the chat box. If you prefer to speak and your network is good, you will be allowed to ask your questions directly. But all questions will be kept till the end of the presentation. So we will take all questions at the end, and if you can post them, we'll be very glad. After the technical session, uh, we'll go straight into the general meeting where I will give update on the application for full membership, which we have submitted to the NSC Secretariat. I will give you more feedback on that today. 
also of interest, there will also be an open forum at the end of the meeting where we will engage very informally and in a very relaxed manner to discuss issues to do with global south challenges, root causes, and solutions as well. So there's a lot to take away from today's session. So without much ado, uh, I will want to again welcome our very distinguished guest speaker, Professor Edwards, uh, to come and deliver his lecture. I will stop sharing my slides now, uh, David, so you can take charge um, and take control of the of the forum. Thank you, books. Pro Professor Edwards, please can you un unmute yourself? I've have had to mute, mute everyone. Yes, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Um, good to be here today. Um, if people could turn the cameras off, it would help um, with, with the speed of the connection. Uh, so thank you for that. And um, I will say an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, lovely to meet you all. I would say hello to all my friends there who speak English. Uh, and also, uh, salam alaikum to those people from uh, our colleagues uh, north of the country, which I believe is uh, the case. I'm going to share this screen with you now. Abooks, can you see the screen okay? Yes, yes, we can. We can. Thank you. Okay, so I've been involved in uh, this issue of Industry 4.0 and digitization of um, construction, civil engineering, manufacturing. A wide range of industries working with a number of experts and so what i would like to do today is just give you an introduction to this and also give you a, a tantalizing glimpse into two projects that i'm working on one with a major uh, original equipment manufacturer one of the biggest equipment manufacturers in the world and also working with the uk government so i hope you enjoyed the presentation and uh, obviously feel free to ask any questions at the end So, there's myself looking very smart when I actually go to work. Uh, my contact details are there with um, Katie's where most people uh, contact me. So, something you want to uh, discuss, feel free. My details are on there and you'll be able to uh, access those at the end of this presentation. So, this keynote presentation today will cover the following. Brief introduction to Industry 4.0, two case studies of Industry 4.0 applications, both uh, very different. And also, I want to challenge peers and colleagues to meet future challenges to opportunities posed. Africa's a rich continent, got some fantastic talent. And I was saying to a book not long ago that um, actually many of the, the best talent you've got in Africa seems to leave Africa for one reason or another and it would be nice to colleagues in, our, in Africa where we're leading in our own right. So I think that would be a, an opportunity there. So the timeline, first of all, Industry 1, that occurred in the black country in the UK back in circa 1700. That's where Thomas Telford built the world's first steel bridge in 1776 i think it was uh down in ironbridge gorge and it's now believed that they used boats and rigging to erect that bridge and that was really the start of the industrial age um and that's one of the reasons why they call it the black country because of all the soot and coal and dirt and debris people were living an awful life at the time living with this miserable landscape where there was no green trees or grass or plants. Even the birds and animals were tinted with soot. And that's where the area got its uh, name from. We then moved further afield into the 1900s with Henry Ford and his uh, streamlined process manufacturing train to building cars. And Henry Ford really pushed the power of automa automation 
working and working on automated machine trains further. To the next leap, which was industry three, particularly in the car vehicle industry where we used robots. We still use robots to great effect. And then finally, into industry 4.0, which is where we've got the latest developments now where we have, um, if you like, a coalescence of technologies, not just robots, but computational intelligence and other things working in coalescence to give modern digital solutions to industry's problems. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So a little bit more detail on what Industry 4.0 is. I've talked about this coalescence of technologies, and those technologies include things like 3D printing. NASA at the moment is experimenting as to whether they can build houses using 3D printing. So this technology isn't something of the future, it's happening today. We also have Sorry, my screen has froze. Bear with me, folks. We have augmented reality, where we take computer-generated images and we transpose onto that reality to generate all sorts of scenarios from training through to medical courses, through to risk assessments and, and on. Big data, big theme now today, whenever you use the, com the computer folks, your usage of that computer is being monitored. It all goes into a big database and it's uh, exposed to all sorts of algorithms to look at your marketing preferences and beyond. Cloud computing, the robots we used to see in the 1960s sci-fi sci sci films um, couldn't operate without cloud computing because there isn't a, a chip powerful enough to hit those machines. But with cloud computing, we can have massive servers operating with huge computational power driving those robots forward. Cybersecurity, big issue now with cybercrime and also increasing applications of blockchain. Cybersecurity fit that industry 4.0 umbrella. We also have smart sensors and I'll be talking about some of those smart sensors today acting through everything from monitoring transportation on linear assets on the highway through to managing machines and robotics in an industrial setting. In terms connectivity between houses, properties, buildings and people that seems to be a, a, a real viable opportunity there that is already occurring. Location detection, pinpointing where people, vehicles, and other resources are, are, are placed. And finally, robotics and AI. The world is becoming intelli increasingly intelligent and artificial intelligence now is underpinning virtually every aspect of our modern day life. And that again is already occurring. In fact, these applications are with us today. And what we're now trying to do is see how we can extend those applications into other areas. So let's look at a couple of practical examples. I can't go into too much detail on some of these because they are down to the disclosure agreement, but I can give you a, a flavour of what they involve. This one was led by myself working with JCB the world's largest uh, equipment manufacturers and we wanted to look at earth moving machinery and materials handling equipment so this here is a rough terrain telescopic handler you can see it's got a, a fixed weight of water barrels on the end there that's strapped to the end of the forks and what we find is that a lot of these machines overturn because people either don't use the outriggers at the front of the machine and or um, when the machine's actually operating and, and uh, lowering that boom, the machine becomes quite unstable. Now, I'm not sure whether you can, um, whether this will work today, but I'm going to give it a try. See whether this, um, 
Can you hear the uh, sound there, Rubble? So what you may find there, guys, that was a, just a test of this machine without riggers out. And what you find is, as the arm geometry of the machine transfers from a position to a higher position, the center of gravity of, of the machine moves towards the rear axles. And as that center of gravity moves towards the rear axles, it creates instability of the machine. And in extreme cases, the wheels at the back of that machine can lift off the ground. I have published in this area in uh, engineering construction art recently. Um, so if anybody is interested, they could always look at that paper. But that was one of the problems we were looking at. How do we increase productivity without compromising safety? So what we did, that was me there a couple of years ago now with uh, very freezing cold conditions in the UK. I think it was about minus six degrees out in the countryside so it was extremely cold working with a number of machines and manufacturers we created a, a, a test application where we had a machine that machine used gps and gis so it could understand and also um, the position in relation to the surrounding environment we had smart sensors fitted to the rear axles of the machine so we could sense how that load was being transferred from the front to the back to give that um, instability that we were looking at there. We connected that to a satellite um, Internet of Things option. That was then beamed down to our server. And on that server, we were running big data and also we were running computational intelligence algorithms to basically monitor the performance of the vehicle in real life. From that data, we observed that the cutoff switch for the safe load indicator on the machine was actually adding to the instability because the safe load indicator couldn't differentiate between the machine traveling on level ground when compared to a machine traveling with the load. And so if we could disable that uh, technology and focus on how that center of gravity moves to the back of the machine, we were able to devise a machine that didn't cut out the hydraulics when needed, in other words, to try and prevent uh, an overturn, but we're able to use that hydraulic power to generate greater performance in the machine overall. Now, if you don't believe that statement, I've got a few statistics example we looked at various performance metrics over an eight hour working day and we looked at various efficiency rates or utilization rates from 20 to 200 typically for a machine in the uv um, farmyard machines like tractors or excavators in construction a typical utilization rate is around about 85 percent which equates to roughly 50 working minutes in the hour. By using this automated approach, we were able to push the from just over 100, well, 1,400,000 uh, uh, kilograms up to a considerable 1,800,000. So we're actually adding on to that an extra 400,000 at maximum level, that's at 100%, onto the productivity performance of the machine. Now that has a massive value elsewhere because what you're doing there, not only are you generating more productivity performance, 
So you're making the machine far more competitive for local businesses, but you're also saving on the environment because you can get the job done quicker, which means that the company is more profitable. You have to use less fuel. And there was all sorts of financial, environmental uh, and production impact uh, improvements technology today. So as a result of that, JCB have now patented an idea that we worked on as a mechanical engineering solution and that idea is now being used on all JCB machines, which is a fantastic achievement. The next stage is really development and this is where we're now focusing our efforts on I'm moving forward now to a fully automated machine with driverless technology and I'm working with a books. I'm looking at some of this at the moment and also the UK government's Highways England on a grant that's worth about £350,000 over the next few years. We're already holding back on some of the uh, technology that we've got with OEMs because obviously that's fueling work that we're developing here in this respect and we've taken the lessons from that study into the second case study which although is a completely different type of industry we're moving there from farmyards farming agriculture and production civil engineering we've now moved and adopted this same technology in manufacturing so the synergies here are the same. This time I worked on a grant looking at digitization, working with my rear here, Al Said. Between us, well, I, I won a large grant from Innovate UK employee, you're here on grant, and the grant has just finished this month. So I'm able to give you a, an update on where we are. So, application of BIM to the machine. That's what we've tried to do here. Now BIM has been blown out of all proportion in my humble opinion. It is just a piece of software but when you link BIM with Industry 4.0 it becomes a very very exciting proposition and that's what we've tried to do in this research. So here's a in the UK sat around the table there all working on their laptops trying to design in this instance uh, vanity units and those vanity units are being used to uh, complete washrooms and um, uh, service stations and hospitals and all sorts of industry throughout, throughout the UK and abroad. Those designs are then taken by hand and put into the manufacturing plant, which has some level of automation. At the moment, the team on the left there were using CAD drawings predominantly, and those drawings would go down to the uh, gentleman on the manufacturing plant, and they would input the dimensions and what have you manually. Now, the problem with that is that mistakes happen because we're all human, and that's what it is to be human to make and make errors and so we were up to say wastage of materials and around about 15 percent of mistakes from drawings that hadn't been updated or people that taken that information uh, the updated information and moved it on so there was all sorts of errors from rework to omissions to simple mistakes going on it was costing the business an absolute fortune so what we said is if we use BIM as a technology and we can also directly into the BIM model, that BIM model is then transposed directly. The machines themselves can take the drawings directly from the drawings that and build the units we can from the process. Now I say ostensibly because of course if somebody makes an error when they're entering the, the data then 
you, you can't really legislate for that. But we're now working on a new system where, where we have choices of, of bespoke packages that people just simply uh, tick as a radio button and then that piece of equipment is then manufactured live in the plant. So to do this, the first stage, and that there are se several information stages, was first of all to look at the information there. That looks horrendously complex as a data flow to understand from the customer on the uh, top left hand corner there through to information ex ex exchange through to estimation information exchange cab development and so on we had to identify where that order flowed through and also who was responsible who was the gatekeeper at each of those processes once we mapped those processes we were then in a better position to create a relational data data that relational database could then link up all of the information in the process. And once we'd created that relational database as a back end system, we we're then able to look at the swim lanes in production. So, from the initial conceptualization and preparation, we could tie BIM and sensors and databases and algorithms and augmented reality into a final product. So that the customer could order the product, they could view the product, they could approve the product, and then take that product right the way through to the factory, literally at the click of buttons. So where we had all these problems and delays previously, we've now got a seamless system that is both bottom up and um, acting as, a, as an outward source to to our customers so that we're embracing them within this modern process and this modern application so the BIM model has an upstream that goes to the architect or contractor bear in mind the BIM model is held by the engineering company we have a downstream process of manufacturing plant that builds and creates the actual product that the contractor and the architect actually want. In this case, those two individuals are our client. That merges together into the client delivery. If there is a, say, a, a lump sum like, um, I don't know, one of the NEC contracts today, that then moves on to an FM team holder. So once the product is built, we hand over and try to assure a soft landing. So in other words, the people who use the building are having their expectations met in terms of the facilities that are fitted out within the building. We have a facility now where as the BIM model is updated, it goes straight to the FM team. So instead of having an as design bill BIM, we have a live BIM, not even an as built one, a live BIM that is constantly updated so that anyone who uses that building or maintains that building can see exactly the status of that building at any given time. And then we also have information that moves on to demolition. So we can download the final BIM model after all the various changes in functionality and use uh, and equipment that's been changed, whether it's be furniture or whether it be geometric information. We record that throughout the whole life cycle of the process. So now not only have we got here um, a technology now that transfers a design straight to, through to the machine train, we've also got um, a different dimension here where we have um, architects and manufacturers working closely together and the other dimension is that we have the FM team tied into these models so that when that building or facility is handed over that they have an up-to-date live BIM working on constantly throughout the whole life cycle of that structure or building or asset and they can maintain that structure building or asset so much better 
because they've got all the latest information at their disposal. And that to us was a, a fantastic uh, project and it's been rated very highly and we're now working on the next development of this project with another bid recently gone in to extend this capability even further than what we've already done. So next phases of development, again, automated voice recognition. We've now um, completed that work and now you can talk to a computer and that uh, computer will follow your every instruction. You don't even have to know how to operate BIM now. You talk to a machine, a machine does the work for you. We're about to release that paper shortly and you know, I would ask people to have a look at that because the uh, videos that are linked to it are absolutely amazing. And uh, it just shows you how far we've come now with using robotics, automation, intelligence, and other things to gel together as part of this Industry 4.0 coalescence. We're also updating and uh, continually activating voice control so we can use different languages in the model now, which is fantastic. So that even if you don't speak English as a first language, you'll be able to operate uh, the, this new technology efficiently, effectively. And we're also dealing with uh, accents as well. So we're having a, a massive database at the moment with all sorts of accents going in with all the keywords so that the machine learning algorithms within the package can actually learn from the words that people use. So again, this is a massive leap forward in terms of manufacturing processes in developed countries and there is nothing stopping developing or emerging countries doing something similar. In terms of the research team, we have an extensive team of people working with us on this project from America down to Brazil, South Africa, where I've got my distinguished chair position, Johannesburg, I'll just go back to that. Uh, Hong Kong, working at Hong Kong Poly U, and also Deakin and University of South Australia. University of South Australia have got um, a visiting chair down there at the moment. So all of these people, we've got PhDs running in this area and we're linking up a global network. And again, there's nothing stopping uh, people today listening to this, joining that network and participating in this exciting research which is gonna transform the way that we operate and work in the future. So finally, bigger professional teams. I've missed off the eye there. Do, that was supposed to say bigger, do apologize. Um, it was very early this morning when I typed this in. Multidisciplinary teams is the way to go. I'm a firm believer of that. I think we have to break down the barriers of people thinking that they're an engineer or a construction man or a manufacturing guy or nuclear physicist. For me, a research problem is a research problem. And there's great commonalities in research problems that require different speciality knowledges from. So I would say construction, civil engineering, original equi equipment manufacturers, engineers, and professional bodies should be working together on one side. And on the other side, we have to include people from IT, artificial intelligence, cybercrime, hardware engineers, people to work effectively in those far bigger teams. Now this is already happening if you look at literature in some of the best journals around the world. It, it's gone beyond just a, a, a single discipline, a monodiscipline approach into clearly multidisciplinary approaches and it's yielding some fantastic results and that is certainly the way that I will intend to uh, continue working in the future. So, without further ado, I hope you've all enjoyed that presentation. It is a vignette of different projects that I'm working on. So I'm more than willing to, to listen to any uh, comments you've got to make or questions. And um, Thank you for coming here today. It is a real pleasure to, to be with uh, my good friends in Nigeria now, and uh, I look forward to 
maybe coming with the books one day, I would see you guys and presenting some more and working with some of your talents in Nigeria and seeing whether we can get some of these things going in your country too. So thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you very much, David, um, for that. Um, I think we have opened the floor now for questions. Um, if you have any question for David, I think he'll be more than happy to take it now. If you put your hands up, I can uh, identify you and I will um, unmute you to speak. And then when colleagues um, pose their question or put their hands up, let me ask David a quick question then. Uh, David, I, I realize that this is a new um, technology, um, not just for developing countries or emerging countries, but even for the developed countries as well. Uh, so I, I wonder what has been the main challenge um, for you observed in trying to operationalize this new way of thinking? Okay, that's, that's, a, great, um, that's a great question of books. Um, so thank you for asking that. And uh, as I say, a lot of people may have other questions and if you do, just put your hand up. But um, I think the main, the main sort of area really is interoperability, not, not just in BIM. Everybody talks about interoperability in BIM, but it's the way that coding uh, fits within BIM, but also how it transpires into the software that your customers are using. It, transfers into how that uh, coding fits into the machines and the codes that you put in there. It, it's about overcoming those barriers so that you get one homogenous system that you can talk to without having to continually um, switch between packages or switch between operations languages to, to achieve the objectives you're trying to achieve. So I think that's been the, the biggest um, one of the biggest factors, that, that technology aspect. But in terms of buying, I think that's been huge as well, because when you're pioneering in a piece of work and when you're leading the way and people haven't, aren't used to, to what you're trying to do and um, they can't see the value in it at first, we had a, a real struggle with the people manufacturing plant at first to show them that this system would actually give them a better job and would actually lead to more job creation and more wealth. In many ways, some of the guys felt that these machines and these algorithms were, were going to take, they haven't taken the jobs away. What they've done is they've upskilled. So people have got other skills and knowledge that they can now use. So, a little bit like the Luddites in ancient Britain years ago, where they smashed up all the looms in the first industrial revolution, convincing people that this is the way to go has, has been another significant social problem, not a technical problem. Thank you very much, uh, David, for that um, robust uh, response. I haven't seen any hand yet. I'm not, I'm not too sure that my, my glasses is the, the reason why. I can see Galaxy S8 on there. Oh, okay, please. Okay, please unmute um, yourself, Galaxy X8. Hi, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Books, for organizing this. This is uh, Dr. Sandy Popoola from Imperial College London. I I'm very much interested in your augmented reality process that you mentioned earlier. And it's something that I've tried to use a couple of years ago to try and train our students to uh, predict what stage the project will be from day one to, to day five. And my question to you is that, how reliable is that system? How, how come that system hasn't really, really take, over, to take on or it hasn't been accepted in the, in, the, in the world of construction? There's all, obviously a new technology coming out now trying to uh, do the same thing much faster and quicker. From your own experience, yeah. is the augmented reality something that you think that really, really going to take up or not? I think it, it's already with us is the answer, is the simple answer. 
it's already here. And whether people kick and scream and resist it, it it's 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 not really there really. I've, it, it's with us going to steal a march in this area and the people that are to cutting edge of knowledge and really driving forwards with innovation are the people that are going to, to benefit most or at least the best ideas at survival of the fittest will uh, get the best ideas. So for me, augmented reality is, is already here. It's already been used. There is some social resistance, as I alluded to earlier, within some of the uh, construction firms. For example, we just completed a, a case study research looking at industry four applications in construction in smart and sustainable built environment. That was one of my undergraduates that uh, published that paper. And what we found in that research paper was that most of the construction practitioners were fixated with BIM. They couldn't see the wider benefits of sensor-based technologies and augmented yeah. Yeah. all those other constituent parts. And yet in reality, they were using many of these technologies as a facilities management company because sensor-based technologies are already embedded in most modern buildings, particularly in the building management systems. So it, it's really trying to get over to people how technology can coalesce. That's, that's the major problem. I mean, you think about it, 20, 30 years ago, if, I don't know whether you're that old, or, I can't see your face there, but <laughs> I'd imagine you're a fairly a young, good looking man. Um, <laughs> but if, if you can imagine 20, 30 years ago, who would have thought that we'd have mobile tech now and people with, you know, smartphones and God knows what else walking. Oh, there you yeah. are. You're a good looking young man. <laughs> Thank um, you. You've got a face very similar to mine in that, you know, you've obviously uh, had a haircut. We, we could be brothers <laughs> there, couldn't we? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think technology is always moving forwards and in many ways it creeps up on industry surreptitiously and people start to use it even mounting things like location detection we've got that on phones yeah. already and you know security yeah. services monitor phones already so people say yeah. what use is this what good is how can we use it but the fact is we're already using these technologies drive on the um, on the highway up and down the m6 if you're from yeah. imperial and uh, as, as I'm doing work with, with Highways England, the, the fuzzy logic uh, technologies now on their, their camera system that picks up yeah. pattern detection, that's yeah. been with face, face, face recognitions and all these things, yes. Absolutely. I think, I think uh, my suggestion, I think the name probably needs to be changed. If the name is changed to something that people will be more comfortable. The moment you say argumented reality, or even reality is fine. They go argumented, people always think, there's so much mathematics behind it and it's going to be very difficult for them to implement and they basically scared out of it without realizing it's actually, actually quite straightforward. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. I absolutely agree with what you've said there. That is the voice of common sense. And that's, that's why I think people like yourself and, and other distinguished people, you know, if we can develop uh, graphical user interfaces that are user-friendly, the people feel as though you know what, this is just like a mobile phone. The more we can yeah. do that to get a product that is simple, the mm -hmm. more we're going to get uptake from the masses and the more people will get involved in that. So, you know what, that was a fantastic question. Thank you. Really appreciate Thanks, that. Dave. And if ever you're Thanks. in Birmingham, come and see me. And COVID-19's no over. <laughs> That's right. All right, David. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Oh, Thank you, Dr. Um, Thank you very much for that. David, can you see the chat or I should read the questions? We have a couple of questions there for you. Do you want to read them or you can, you can see them from your window? Okay, chat. I wasn't looking at those. Okay, warm welcome. Uh, Patrick, hello everyone. What is being done to ensure variety device admit standards? Oh, so that's the stupid hacking as well. Right, okay. Um, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of security standards going out at the moment um, and being considered. considered. Uh, for smart technologies. One of the things that people are you, looking at at the moment, you'll see it a lot in, in the press and in the news, is blockchain technology. And more and more people are trying to use blockchain technology as the new security method. How successful that is going to be, I'm not 100% sure. 
but it certainly looks more robust than some of the secure socket layers we've had on internet systems in the past, which can be e easily bypassed. So I would say if you're a budding engineer here, Patrick, and you want to get a name for yourself, I would say start looking around the area of applications you could make in an engineering context, because I would think that there's a, a huge opportunity for a talented young person like yourself to really make a name for themselves in that area. Um, Stephen Granville, I said, greetings, I have a question. Stephen, if you're online. Well, I can see you're online, Stephen, with the smart suit there. Do you want me to take your question? Okay. Um, good evening. Um, Hello, Stephen. Professor, okay, I can hear you now. Good evening, um, Professor David. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Stephen. You look very smart there. You look more like a professor than I do. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for such an informative presentation. Um, you talked about um, smart sensors, yeah? And um, some projects you're working on for Highway England, yeah? Yes. The smart sensor sensors you talked about, is he um, part of the motorway incident detection and automatic signaling? We, we, we are looking at that because what we find is when people are, say for example, driving um, a vehicle, a warning vehicle that uh, drives in front of traffic, yeah. and basically warns motorists that a lane is closed, that's normally driven by uh, an operator. Yes. So a human being. And what okay. we're tending to find is that some people who are less intelligent than ourselves try to undertake on the highway into the, these vehicles and the barriers and uh, leading to either a fatality of the driver of the, um, the signal machine or the, themselves and or both. So okay. what we try to do there is use robots on the highway to use a, a range of uh, system so um, vehicle to infrastructure is one method or vehicle to vehicle is another um, different systems you can use we're trying to link those up together and what we find is that there's some success but also some of the sensors are being blinded by for example reflective strips on crash barriers for example okay. so they're struggling in some cases but we are slowly getting there and what we believe we'll have is a fully automated robot driving up and down the way in the future uh, without the need for an operator to endanger themselves. That's what we believe we'll have. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Just, just, just before we take the next question, David, please, um, I just want to rec recognize the presence of um, the current president of Nigerian Society of Engineers. In other words, if you want to go to Nigeria, he, he needs to give you approval, otherwise you will, not be, you, you will not be allowed in, David. So that is why I've tried to introduce him now. So, president, you are most welcome, sir. Who, who am I addressing? I think who? Pre president is on mute. Uh, engineer Babakana Mohamed. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, am I on now? You are on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> hey, books, Dr. Books. First, let me congratulate Manchester branch for this outing. This is the fourth series of your meetings. I'm happy with Manchester branch. I'm happy with all of you. You are, your registration is coming very soon. Very, very soon. And I mean very soon. You will be a branch of NSC very soon. Right by law. And then from there, we'll drive from your point of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you, President. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes. Mr. President, Mr. President, sir. Ah, my sir. president is there. My president is there already. So, yes. I think my guess that you are hosting two or three presidents in, in, this, in your forum every day. So, I don't want to talk again. I don't want to talk again. I am... My powers are limited by my, the presence of my president, so I keep quiet now. I cannot talk again. Because in NAC, we have a tradition for respect for our elders. So since my, my president is in the house, I think whatever I want to say, I'm not going to say it again, is 
is overruled by my president. So, and whatever that, my president what, says, that's how it is. Please stand by it. What I've said is that we are lining up behind our president. The president, we are behind you, sir. No, you be behind me. Behind me. I will be behind you, the president, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are all like behind you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Dr. Ebus, we are very grateful for, for what you are doing. In fact, I knew you are very passionate about NSM, about human capital development, and that's a good one. You, you knew very well where we are coming from. When I say we are, you knew our country, you knew our deficiencies. It is, the onus now is on all of us. When I say all of us, I mean in all its entirety, all of us, to develop manpower. The little we have, Please, let's pass it down. Let's mentor our younger ones. Let's mentor the younger ones. Let's bring them on board. And, and now, the good thing is, I don't need to come to Manchester to inaugurate the Manchester branch. The beauty of COVID-19. That's the beauty of COVID-19. People will think, yeah, COVID-19, people are dying, A, B, C, D. No, people are dying. Yes, that's how it is. But there is a good side of it. And that, at least part of it, at least now we are holding this meeting. I'm not coming from Nigeria. I'm not spending money. I'm not risking life to play. So many things are at stake. And I'm very happy about it. Very, very happy. So please, <coughs> we'll engage Manchester branch on so many issues because we have so many issues on ground. You have so many professors and so many high level <laughs> technical people in that, in that zone. Will leverage on your experiences, please. Mm -hmm. Call you anytime to be our leads Inshallah. in presentations. Please avail yourself to us. And I saw Professor this is making good, nice presentation. I came in late, but I was watching it from another top. I refused to, <laughs> I asked somebody to join in, and then I'll be watching from another top. top. I did that deliberately so that you don't know that I am watching. <laughs> I, I'm very happy. I, I'm very happy. I'm very happy what you are doing, and I, that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Please, and make you have to be timely. Please be timely. Whatever you are doing, be timely. I appreciate all of you, and God bless all of you. Thank you very much, sir, President. Thank you, President. Thank you, sir. Thank you, President. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for breaking the ice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my president. Thank, thank you, for, you, Mr. Thank, president. Thank you for breaking the ice. <laughs> it has been an absolute pleasure, and um, I believe you've got my former PhD student, Dr. David Aloki, coming on shortly. And David is one of the finest students I've ever taught, a Nigerian gentleman and minister. He's an absolutely fabulous gentleman, and... Uh, You'll have a, a, a brilliant uh, presentation from him, I'm sure. Um, very passionate gentleman. It just goes to show that uh, when we're talking about Manpora there, that you know Nigeria is, is as good as anywhere on the planet. So it is about sharing that knowledge. And uh, a, a good man said to me, David, it takes very little effort for the flame of one candle to light another. And I, I do believe that. So uh, let, let's try and keep this open. There is something to be said about breaking the bread over the table as well. So at some stage, I am hoping to come to Nigeria with the books. But I'll take one more question before I go. Books, if that's okay. I can see Akilu has asked a question about, considering that the, this will involve several stakeholders, OEMs, of whom, what are the potential data security and IP challenges? Well, that's a fantastic uh, question. Are you on, Akilu? Hi. Akilu. Yes. Hi, I, I can see the top of your head, I think. Can you see me now? Oh, I you dare not forget me, David. Head. You dare not forget me, David. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of these, low five. <laughs> I made sure this is a question. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Good one. <laughs> I think it's lovely to see you again. I, I would say, in, in terms of your question, uh, I think there are non -dis I'm, I'm subject myself to a non disclosure agreement. Um, right. So, JCB have 
pin me down that I can't talk too much about that research. But what I can do by learning from that project is work with other people and show people to um, embrace technology for the long sort of issues and problems. So knowledge is one of those things, once you've got it, it's very, very difficult to disinvent knowledge. And, and so what I would say is, yes, there, are, there is some competition out there. It's, it's a very well-made question and point, but I think there are ways in which we can address that and still share knowledge with other people in a more generic manner. That's what I would say. Thank you. I understand perfectly. <laughs> Thank you very much. For a call, calling you from San Francisco today, uh, I can move. What? Sorry? <laughs> you, 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 I don't know if it's... <laughs> I, I don't know if my network is... Uh, uh, you're breaking a little bit, David. I think David's network is not good. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I think David was referring to your... Oh, he was referring to my background. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. <laughs> um, I think we, we are going to bring this to a close now, but I just want to quickly um, seek the permission of the past president, whether he has any observation uh, to make before we bring um, the uh, vote of thanks for, for David. Past president, sir. Engineer Laura Femi. Okay, maybe we've lost him. Um, um, can I welcome? Um, he's, he's on, he's on. He has just gone off mute. Okay. Okay, Dr. Books, please continue. Okay, um, I think um, we want to thank David for the... ...can help you optimize your work and company processes, intelligence 3D modeling for architecture, engineering and construction professionals. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, technology, I guess. So thank you very much, David, for, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think I want to invite our um, secretary, general secretary, to come and give you... a. A um, vote of thanks um, as we want to move into the general meeting. Irene, please. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Professor David, for this very interesting presentation. <clears throat> I've learned a lot today about utilizing uh, a smart built environment, and truly, the future is today. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for your time, and um, personally, I've learned a lot from this session. And uh, I think other members, I think other members have learned as well. Thank you very much for coming, and we hope that when we call you again, you will answer us. And um, we can't wait to welcome you to Nigeria as well. So thank you. Thank you, Irene. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I've heard that Nigerian prices are much better than Ghanaian. So I'm looking forward to some of your food. <laughs> don't, don't go into that debate, dog, uh, Professor Edwards. <laughs> okay. Do, do I need to, to leave the meeting or book so you can have your general meeting? Is that? Yeah, you're more than welcome to stay because yeah, you're more than welcome to stay because we'll have a, a free um, open forum and you know so it is a pleasure to have you if, if you don't mind. It will be a very brief meeting and um, we shouldn't be that long. Okay, can Otherwise, I book? Oh, can I? Can yeah, what, what? Um, yeah. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Yeah, I just wanted to say hello to um, um, Professor David Edwards and. Um, I had a question, but maybe I could ask. I could call him and ask to ask some other time. But it, it is, it is time for that. Okay, no, just go ahead. You're already on. Just go ahead. Right, go okay, on. okay. Uh, my question was, um, what are the challenges? Because I, I know um, BIM is, is is 
you in Africa, what would, what would be the challenges that you think adopting it would be? So if people thinking of using that kind of model can prepare for it rather than just diving into it without understanding what the challenges might be from the experience in the West, there must have been challenges adopting it, changing from Canada to other previous technologies. So that, that's the area that I'll be thinking of. The challenges in changing, transiting from the normal existing kind of technology used right now to a more advanced technology. Okay. Um, that's a really, really good question, Kenneth. And I would like to make a, a brief observation first and then get on to the question. So it, it's a long-winded answer, but bear with me. What I would say is that there's a long history legacy in Africa where African academics follow the trend of what the West is doing. Now, BIM has been used in the West for more than 20 years. And what I would challenge African academics to do is not to follow on the back of that curve, but to get up front with future initiatives, look at Industry 4.0 and appreciate that BIM is just a small part of Industry 4.0. And if Africa is to uh, lead in the world in terms of that race for technology, you need to be at the head of the crest of the wave and not following behind it. And from what I'm seeing at the moment with a lot of, uh, not Africans in, in, in the West, you know, if you look at people like Chime Numba and books and David T and all these fabulous African Afri academics who've got many of them Nigerian, they're at the crest of the wave. But the research I'm seeing in Africa is very much talking about something that's already happened and occurred in the West. And, and so what you end up doing is replicating or duplicating that same work, but just sticking the word of West Africa or Nigeria or, you know, some other country on the front. So my strong advice would be not to focus on BIM, but to focus on Industry 4.0, because that's the way that everything is working now. And technical colleges worrying about, you know, teaching people on, on BIM. If you're interested in research, get onto Industry 4.0. That would be my view. Does that make sense, okay. Kenneth? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll probably need to uh, go further into that uh, um, PowerPoint that you sent. Um, I'm sure I'll be able to get that from uh, Dr. Books. Great Thank stuff. You. And that looks a very smart gentleman on that picture there, doesn't it? Oh, crikey. That, mm -hmm. That's some, some chain there, isn't it? There. Or, or, you know, <laughs> that, and you know what? I've been here today and... I can, there's a real tangible sense of, of excitement and, and opportunity and brilliant people working together. So, you know, if uh, Irene and colleagues here, the, the prestigious presidents we've got, if they want to invite me back at some stage, it'd be a pleasure to come back and speak to you guys again. I really, really enjoyed it. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, inviting me here today. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, Camille. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Professor David. 